I love this topic in the same way that I love the topic of stainless steel brushes because it's all about education. It's understanding the why behind what you're doing. The first thing I want to point out is that no cleaning can happen on the clean side. That completely negates the purpose of the clean side. If you're cleaning on the clean side, it's now the dirty side. Beyond Clean offers a creative look into the inner workings of a healthcare industry committed to getting it right. Every instrument, every time. Join us every week as we explore the hidden world of one of the most important aspects of safe surgical care. And now your hosts, Hank Balch and Justin Poulin. This week on Beyond Clean, we speak with Lindsay Brown, Clinical Education Manager at Key Surgical. We're going to be talking all things brushes today, Hank, and Lindsay Brown is an engaging and passionate guest that I think everybody is going to enjoy hearing from today. That's right, and if you were at the ISHA meeting in Nashville this past year, you got a chance to hear her on the closing day, but um, I'm excited to go beyond the brush and, and really delve into one of the most uh, central tools in our job as sterile processing professionals, so I cannot wait to get to the interview. As a reminder, you can subscribe to Beyond Clean on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify, or search for Beyond Clean on your favorite podcast application. We can also be heard on the Sterile Education app available on iTunes and Android. Follow Beyond Clean on Twitter at Beyond Clean Info, Facebook.com slash Beyond Clean Podcast, LinkedIn.com slash Company slash Beyond Clean, Instagram is Beyond Clean Podcast, and our YouTube channel, YouTube.com slash Beyond Clean, featuring Beyond the Headlines with Mike Matthews, Real Talk with Bob Mars, and Fighting Dirty with Hank Balch. Contact us by emailing info at beyondclean.net. Are you a hero? Do you want to attend the Isham Conference and Expo? News Splash, your free weekly central service newsletter, announces this year's CS Week Challenge, where you can be awarded a scholarship to attend the 2020 Isham Conference and Expo, plus receive a one-year paid Isham membership. Let the team at News Splash know how you keep patient safety high by entering at ultracleansystems.com slash achievers. Three entries will be selected, and the top recipient will receive $500 in expense assistance to attend the event in Chicago next year. Go to ultracleansystems.com slash achievers today. Is your central service or sterile processing department prepared for a regulatory survey? If you can't answer with a resounding yes, you should contact Beyond Clean. Our experts will perform a survey in your facility to help you determine your survey readiness. We can evaluate acute care, ambulatory, and dental facilities. Our team will guide you through the survey process to ensure that you are beyond ready for your next survey. And we can stay with you after the consultation, offering virtual consulting and mentorship programs to maintain the progress you have made and to continue making process improvements. Contact us today to schedule a free 30-minute initial consultation. You're listening to Beyond Clean, the global voice of sterile processing. Joining us now is Lindsay Brown, Clinical Education Manager at Key Surgical. Lindsay, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Hank and Justin. It's such a pleasure to be included in, in this groundbreaking podcast. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for the kind words, and I can tell you, <laughs> Hank and I love it. It's a labor of love, but we've enjoyed it and uh, have really appreciated the positive feedback, such as uh, what you just said. And, you know, I'm excited to dive into brushes. I think we said this before we came on air, but I used to work for a company who was uh, a main competitor, and so I definitely know a lot about brushes, and maybe some people are like, ah, it's brushes, but I actually think... <laughs> there is a lot to discuss on this topic, and I remember telling people about why the right size and why the right uh, brush for the right situation, and I know we'll dive into that today. I agree with you. It is it is a question of the ages. What what What's the big deal? It's just a cleaning brush, isn't it? And so, yes, I'm excited to dive into why brushes do matter, because they absolutely do. Well, let's, yeah, let's dive right into it. Let's do sort of an intro Two brushes, you know, the different kinds, the uses, some of the purposes, maybe give an overview of, of brushes to start. 
one thing that's very interesting in in the world of education, in the world of sterile processing, when you talk to people about the most basic and the most versatile tool in their repertoire, it kind of gets them thinking about, okay, why does this matter for my daily job? Why does this impact my ability to be successful in my profession? And the cleaning brush is one of those tools that's so simple and so basic, but it makes a world of difference when it comes to preparing surgical instrumentation for a successful and a safe surgery and safe patient outcomes. Um, so it's one of those things, where do I start? Because brushes are fabulous. They're interesting. And I think the, the one place to start is the fact that you need the right brush for the cleaning job at hand. There are a myriad sizes, a myriad different types, um, different bristle types, different handle types. Um, so I can kind of just start from the beginning and kind of break it down a little bit on what I see as most prevalent in our industry currently and kind of what the end users typically see when they talk about finding the right tools uh, for cleaning the instruments in their department. Um, I kind of want to start with the anatomy of a brush, because this is something that not a lot of people think about. They think about the cleaning tool, they think about needing a brush, but they don't necessarily take it apart and dissect it a little bit to say, okay, there are different types of bristles, there are different types of handles. What bristle can I marry with this handle type um, to create the perfect tool for the cleaning job at hand? So when we talk about the bristles themselves, you have everything from a synthetic fill, um, things like nylon and polypropylene. Um, natural fibers, those are fibers that you don't necessarily see in sterile processing very often. You can kind of put cotton pipe cleaners in that category. But one thing about natural bristles is they're very porous. So it's not something that we see on the decontam side when we talk about cleaning instruments. Um, and then you see the wire bristles, the um, stainless steel and the brass. And we can talk about this a little bit more, but wire bristles tend to get a bad rap, but there is a time and a place for those types of brushes. So I'm excited to get into that a little bit too. Um, when we talk about the handle of a brush, you have the twisted stainless steel, which a lot of folks say, well, what does that matter? Well, it's twisted because it holds the bristles in place. Um, so it's actually very functional. Uh, you have the molded plastic block, so your toothbrush style brushes, the ones that look like hair brushes. Um, the semi-rigid tubing, uh, the spring coil stainless steel wire, all of those are different options for the handles themselves. When you kind of dissect the actual bristle types and the handle types, they all have their their pros and their cons. Uh, so when we talk about the actual bristles, nylon, for instance, is the toughest and the most durable um, synthetic fiber available. And when you compare that with something like polypropylene, polypropylene is actually a little bit more aggressive. It's a, a stronger bristle filament. Um, it's got great flex fatigue, good abrasion resistance. And so those are two options that folks can choose between dependent upon what cleaning job is at hand. Uh, and then you get into the, the metal brushes, the, um, the stainless steel and the brass. Brass is kind of a middle step between nylon and stainless steel. So it's the softest metal fiber available. Uh, and then stainless steel is highly resistant to corrosion and heat and chemicals, which makes that an awesome option when you're dealing with those really intense chemicals and in sterile processing. And when you need something that's a little bit more aggressive um, in case you have something that's dried on, dependent upon the material of the instrument that you're about to clean, that might be a really great option. So when you talk about starting from the basics, it, you can pick pretty much anywhere to start. So <laughs> um, that's kind of a, a little bit of background about the, the brush material. Um, and we can kind of get into the, the specifics about things like antimicrobial properties and when to use a specific brush. Um, I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit later on. Yeah, Lindsay, I don't know if you could hear it, but when you said that there is a time and place for stainless steel brushes, there were technicians all across the globe saying, I, yes. yes. <laughs> and there there were really is a time and place. No. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Yeah, so I know we're going to exactly. talk about that. It's a that. hot topic. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're going to delve into that a little deeper, but because you brought it up now, it may be a good time to highlight what is that manager and technician divide when it comes to the stainless steel brush? Why did they get a bad rap? 
it's it's the question of the year, actually the question of the last couple of years. <laughs> and um, I'm excited to kind of dive into it because it is something that needs to be thought about in a, a more critical way. Uh, what I find most often, so I've worked with sterile processing departments across the United States for the last five years, and I've been a sterile processing technician at a hospital here in Minnesota for the last two. And one thing that I think kind of gets lost is the why behind why we either do or don't do certain things. Um, and one of those things is why are we not using stainless steel or why are we taking these out of departments? One thing that I hear often is that stainless steel ruins the passivation layer. Uh, so we're going to get rid of it. Um, and one thing that's interesting is if you actually look at what the passivation layer is, passivation is the process where nitric acid is used to remove any iron content from the hard outer layer of the instrument, right? The removal of that iron helps to build a protective outer layer, which is of chromium oxide. Now, that chromium oxide layer is highly resistant to corrosion, and it continues to harden throughout the instrument's life cycle. And that passivation layer, it can become damaged, but it can become damaged by abrasive chemicals that aren't approved by a manufacturer. It can become damaged by saline. It can't actually become damaged by a stainless steel bristle brush. Um, now, if anyone is um, certified instrument specialist, the CIS through ISHM, they've gone through Rick Schultz's Inspecting Surgical Instruments, an illustrated guide um, book right, the, the study guide. And in that, um, he talks about a, a study showing scanning electron microscope technology um, that shows that no harm is actually caused by stainless steel bristles, making them kind of the perfect brush for hard to clean debris. Now, there's a dissonance that occurs between managers who don't want their techs or want to prevent their techs from using a stainless steel or a, a brass brush on the wrong types of instruments. And I think that's where sort of the, the confusion lies, and that's where the argument lies. Because if you do use a stainless steel or a brass brush on the wrong type of instrument, um, a coated instrument, an insulated instrument, if you use it on a laparoscopic instrument, for instance, you're going to damage it with that stainless steel brush. So I think what's happening is there are a lot of managers who have actually told me, you know what, I don't want to take that risk that someone's going to use this brush on the wrong type of instrument. So what they're saying is they're just going to do away with them completely to mitigate that risk. And so that's where the frustration lies because it, on one hand, yes, it's a great tool if you have caked on bio burden, for instance, that a nylon brush just isn't going to cut through. But on the other hand, you have the potential to do a lot of damage on the types of instrument surfaces that can't actually withstand the rigor and the abrasiveness of a stainless steel option. So I think that's kind of where that dissonance lies. Yeah, and again, the way you kicked that off was let's just be really clear about the whys and the why nots. And I think mm -hmm. where you run into the dissonance that's going out is to say you have a manager who's concerned that newer techs don't understand the distinction of using stainless steel on a coated instrument or not. And then rather than give them a why, you just give them a mantra. And then that exactly. creates yep. a narrative that isn't necessarily accurate. And I'm obviously mm -hmm. very familiar with Rick Schultz's book. And I remember that study. Mm -hmm. We used to, I used to work for Rick at Spectrum Surgical. We used to give that study mm -hmm. out to all the customers under magnification. A hundred times, I think, was one of the images and maybe 50 <laughs> times is the other. But I remember making it a very big point of emphasis. And I think it comes right back to your role with Key Surgical. It really all comes down to education and continuing education and in many cases that stainless steel brush is going to do a phenomenal job of cleaning areas that are difficult to clean and I think specifically if you start to get some staining or anything along mm -hmm. those lines stainless steel brush is going to do a better job under the right circumstances. And I do want to make one point about stainless steel brushes in terms of using it to um, to sort of eliminate rust and I want to sort of um, dispel the myth that rust can be removed with a stainless steel brush. Uh, that's one thing that a lot of techs that I talk with say, you know what, I really miss our stainless steel brushes because it really helps to remove rust off of our instruments. Rust is actually the, the child of pitting. So you can say pitting is the mother of rust, um, if you will. So just by removing the surface rust with a stainless steel tool or, tool or with any tool, uh, it's not eliminating the problem. 
Um, the problem goes a little bit deeper. It's actually an issue with the surface of the instrument being no longer intact. Um, so I do want to kind of dispel that myth that, that stainless steel is good for removing rust because that's not actually the case. It's, it's an instrument surface issue um, when, it, when it comes to rust and, and solving that problem. That's a great point as well there that, um, you know, being a leader of frontline technicians, I have, uh, as you said <laughs> that, I'm thinking, oh, yep, that's a common, <laughs> common understanding out there because mm-hmm. you see it disappear as you're processing because you got this great brush to take it off. And then what happens the next time you see that instrument come through? Nah, it's back again. There's probably means, more rust on it. <laughs> you didn't take it away. Exactly right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. I wanted to spend a couple of minutes here uh, talking about some general usage concepts. So you went into a fantastic background and um, overview of the types of brushes and some of their purposes. Uh, in terms of utilizing brushes in the decontamination area, what are some general ideas that we need to put out there Um to educate technicians to use these things correctly? Uh, One of the things that I think is most important as far as using a brush correctly is knowing exactly what it takes to make it an effective cleaning tool. Um, And those two things are maximum bristle tip contact to whatever surface you're cleaning and then the proper type of bristle. If you marry those two things together, you've you've eliminated the first hurdle uh, with, with getting or moving toward a successful cleaning process. A couple other things is making sure to use the brush under the water surface. <clears throat> if you use a brush above the surface, you have all that splatter spray that could contaminate your work surface, contaminate your PPE more so than is necessary. Um, heaven forbid you're not using the right PPE, then you have a bigger issue on your hands. And that's still something I think our industry is is battling too, is the importance of proper protective equipment. Um, so those two things are critical. So the maximum bristle tip contact with the proper bristle type, using it underwater. Um, there's also the argument that can be made, okay, is it flush, brush, flush? Is it brush, flush, brush? I think whatever the theory is that you're using, whatever um, whatever series of events that you're using to brush, the understanding that friction and fluidics are the two main things the two main things that are at play. So friction, obviously, is two items, you know, rubbing against one another. So when we're talking about cleaning, using a brush to rub against an instrument to remove whatever surface soil is on it. And fluidics is just fluids under pressure. So when you have some sort of fluids that help um, sort of maximize the ability to remove whatever um, soil is on the surface of that instrument, those two things go hand in hand. Um, As far as uh, twisting versus putting a brush in and out, I love to use the analogy of of a vacuum. So think about the last time you vacuumed your rug at home, especially if you have pets (laughs) or if you have children um, or if you have anyone that uses their shoes in the house and they sand. If the actual bristles on the bottom of your vacuum went back and forth, if they moved side to side, you have that suction action, sure, but the bristles themselves aren't actually helping um, sort of lift and remove the soils and the hair and whatever is on your carpet. They spin for a very specific reason. That spinning motion helps maximize the actual contact, the surface area contact. And that spinning also helps lift and remove the dirt and debris. Same theory applies. When you have a lumen that you're trying to clean and beacon dam, if you t- twist that brush through that lumen, it's going to maximize the surface area contact of those brush bristles to the instrument itself, thereby helping to remove more of the bio burden that's potentially inside. So twisting is important. Um, Proper size is important. Size matters when we talk about brushes. Size absolutely matters. If you have a brush that's too big for your lumened instruments, for instance, that brush is not only going to probably get stuck inside of them, um, potentially leading to um, an exorbitant amount of repair costs, uh, brush li- brush stem extraction from your instruments by your repair companies, um, but it could potentially also damage the instrument itself. If you're forcing a brush into there, into those some some of those very narrow lumens, uh, you could bend those instruments very easily. Um, likewise, using a brush that's too small for the lumen, that's also not a good thing because then obviously we don't have that proper um, bristle tip contact to the surface and we're not actually doing any cleaning at all. 
Those are some excellent nuggets of information. And I love a good analogy like that because I think it just helps people <laughs> understand, you know, the action or the mechanism of cleaning. And so really nicely done. We're going to be back after a short break with Lindsay Brown. We're back with Lindsay Brown, Clinical Education Manager at Key Surgical. So now we're going to take a little bit deeper dive here in segment two. We're going to talk about brushes and instructions for use. Why don't we just start right there, Lindsay? Instructions for use. That's like the the term that everybody hates and loves at the same time because you can't, I think it was Steve Kovacs segment that you guys did with him where, where you talked about how you can't get through a CEU presentation without at least once, probably more like five or ten times, mentioning the importance of instructions for use and mentioning the, the critical nature of instructions for use. And so I thought that that was a very apt, <laughs> apt uh, statement about instructions for use. Point blank, they're necessary. They're 100% necessary because as a tech, and I can speak from a tech's perspective because I currently am one, as a tech, I need to know how to do my job. I need to know how the manufacturer of the instruments that I'm cleaning or trying to clean wants me to clean them. I need to know how the manufacturer of the cleaning tools that I'm using to render this instrument safe for patient use, how they want me to use their tools. It's basically me trying to follow directions from 18 different places. So I get that it's, it gets to be kind of a headache for text, but they're so important. They're so critical. And one thing that I think is kind of interesting is in the new Amy Ansi SP79 2017, it talks about if a device manufacturer specifies a brush or a cleaning instrument, that brush or an equivalent should be used. Um, so it, it actually makes reference to um, having a brush that's either equivalent to what's called out in the instructions for use or having the exact brush. Um, so I think that's, that's sort of bold on their part um, when we talk about manufacturers of instruments putting specific brushes in their, their instructions for use. And I'm sure we can do a whole other segment on, on that topic. But the one thing that I do want to point out is that when we're talking about a cleaning brush, the reason why you don't go to a hardware store or you don't go to a big box store and buy a gigantic box of toothbrushes that are great for plaque and great for cavities, but maybe not so good for cleaning instrumentation is because they don't have that instructions for use. They don't have that one thing that you can rely on that says, hey, this is exactly how to use this tool, how to take care of it, how to inspect it, when to discard it, which is just as important as how to use it. Um, so we can get into that a little bit too. But instructions for use are never going to go away. They're always going to be what guides us in our daily work life in the sterile processing department. You know, Lindsay, on my show notes, I have the word toothbrushes written real large with a lightning bolt and thunder. <laughs> And I was going to swoop down in and say, can we use toothbrushes? <laughs> but, uh, Sounds you know, like a comic strip in the making. There, there you go. So you answered that. That's your that. next, your next uh, project. Hank just got a new nickname. He's Captain Clean. <laughs> Captain Clean. I like it. Well, I like it. I've had worse nicknames, I guess. in so. the mail. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, on the IFU question, um, I have been looking at – a lot of IFUs for um, arthroscopic shavers and other items. And it's not just one brush sometimes for a right. model of arthroscopic shaver that we have three different brushes, all specific to the particular part of the instrument that you're using in preparation for this show. I was looking over some robotic IFUs and they're outlining to the millimeter, the size and, and height of the bristles Uh they get specific for a reason, but I feel like if you were to walk into a lot of sterile processing departments and do an audit of their IFUs versus their brush types, you may not walk away with a lot of confidence. Why do you think that is and what's the answer? Well, I think one of the things that sort of plagues a lot of departments is the fact that these instructions for use are made available. Um, but not everyone knows how to access them, nor is the importance 
of accessing them to look for and to reference what cleaning tools are necessary for these instruments really taken into account before these instruments and these devices especially something like a shaver, are brought into a department. A lot of time it's kind of the cart before the horse <laughs> scenario where you get this instrument in and then all of a sudden you're like, well, shoot, we didn't look to see what we actually need to clean this thing. And a lot of departments, I think, get into trouble when they start to bring in instrumentation that needs, for instance, an ultrasonic cleaner. And if they don't have an ultrasonic cleaner, then that's going to be an issue. Or needs those three cleaning brushes to clean this one device uh, if that's not looked at before actually bringing that instrumentation on, I think that, that it just kind of gets missed. Uh, and so they kind of make do with what they have. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think this is going back to our first episode ever with Michael Matthews um, mm -hmm. talking about collaborating with infection control and the huge right. importance of having sterile processing representation on these new product committees, like you say, that's the time to start having that question on do we need another ultrasonic? Uh, do we need another line of brushes to go ahead and get approved so that when the item arrives, the brushes are here and they've already been in service with yep. our technicians. Um, <laughs> exactly. And they're it's not enough prepared. to say, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, so you can't wait a week or two and be using this item without being compliant with those IFUs. So, uh, right. That's a great point. And I think there's, yeah, there's a very specific feedback loop that needs to be sort of buttoned down um, for quality control measures. That feedback loop that that contains input from sterile processing, from the operating room, from supply chain, from infection prevention and risk management. If that feedback loop isn't there, where you have those open lines of conversation or communication and you talk to one another and say, okay, these are the risks, these are the needs, how can we uh, sort of address the needs, make sure that we have what we need so we can mitigate whatever risk um, may come if we don't do that. So that feedback loop is really important, and I think a lot of departments are working on solidifying that and fine-tuning that a lot. So, Lindsay, we've already got one um, clip on here that's going to go viral. Your shout-out to the stainless steel brushes. Oh, I've boy. <laughs> tell. Um, but I want to get into something else that – if it's not uh, the most controversial, it's definitely up at the top, um, and that will be using brushes on the clean side. On oh, that. gosh, I love this topic. I love this topic. In the same way that I love the topic of stainless steel brushes, because it's all about education. It's understanding the why behind what you're doing. The first thing I want to point out is that no cleaning can happen on the clean side. That completely negates the purpose of the clean side. If you're cleaning on the clean side, it's now the dirty side. And that's not what we're going for. So no cleaning should happen on the clean side. Here's what I see often. I see toothbrushes on the clean side. When you're talking about using any sort of tool to check for cleanliness, check for dryness, Typically, you're talking about lumens or cannulated instruments. If you're checking for cleanliness on the clean side, you can see if, for instance, an osteotome is clean. You can use your magnification. You can use your eyes. You can use your critical thinking skills to say, okay, is this clean? Uh, the important part of the conversation that I like to have with people is why are you using the brush? And when I see a toothbrush, for instance, used on the clean side, typically it's used for a shortcut. And this is not something that I love to talk about, but it's reality. I see that brush used to flick whatever, you know, biomatter, whatever matter, whatever material might still be on that instrument as sort of a shortcut instead of sending it back to, um, to the decontam side. Now, when we talk about lumens, that's kind of a different story because we've seen pipe cleaners used, we've seen lumen brushes being used. And one thing that I always challenge people with is if you're using some sort of tool to do a lumen check, whether it be to check for cleanliness or to, to check, check for drying, think about what's happening to that cleaning tool when you put it through the instrument. And a question I love to ask is, have you ever had an instrument come onto the clean side that wasn't completely clean? And the answer from everybody is always yes. We've seen instruments come onto the clean side. They came through the washer. They were manually cleaned on the, clean, uh, on the decontam side, but still something got missed. 
Now, this is where I like to challenge people because when you use a cleaning brush or when you use a pipe cleaner and you put it through that lumen on the clean side, I love asking the question, is bio burden always visible? Can you always see it? Is there always a distinct color? And the answer to that is no, you can't always see bio burden, whether it's lubrication or saliva or just such minute bits of bio burden that you just literally can't see them with your naked eye. That then lends itself to the question, okay, how many times are you reusing this this device or this cleaning tool, this this tool to check for cleanliness, to check for dryness? If you're using it on, you know, a whole tray filled with instruments, what happens if that first instrument that you put that that brush down, that first lumen, what happens if that one was contaminated? And then all of a sudden, you use that same brush or that same pipe cleaner on, you know, 10, 20, 30 more instruments, you've just contaminated all of them. So what I say is if you're using something to check for cleanliness of lumens, to check for drying of lumens, single use is the way to go. Because you can't take that risk that you're going to reintroduce soil into clean lumens by reusing those cleaning tools. So when I talk to folks about brushes on the clean side, there shouldn't be any toothbrushes. Let's be honest. If you're using a toothbrush on the clean side, you're trying to clean something off of a surface that you can see. Um, Those checks can happen in decontam. If you see something on the surface of the instrument that looks like rust, that looks like staining, that looks like bio burden, those assessments can be made on the decontam side. When you get to the clean side, obviously our lumens need to be checked to see if there's bio burden in them. And what's great is we're seeing that the onset of these the boroscopes, those visual inspection tools that also help with that. Um, not every department has one yet, so you have to use other methods in order to do that. But it's important that techs think about how often they're using those cleaning tools and those those check tools. I also get asked the question, well, we do reuse brushes or pipe cleaners on the on the clean side, but we just put them through the washer at the end of the day. Well, if you put something through the washer, you're making the assumption that it's dirty and it needs to be cleaned. And that opens up a whole other can of worms about issues um, with the cleaning processes on the decontam side and sort of how you think about um, what you do um, in, on the clean side and how you sort of dissect it's kind of like an admission right of guilt about it. right it's, it an, is, admi- it's an admission it of guilt yes. on in, and so that certainly isn't something you want to explain if for any right. reason you wound up in a courtroom but i think another exactly. point too is it's not a great verifier or validator of cleaning because of what really you said at the care. very beginning which is you know st79 says that we submerge the instrument for brushing so that we don't aerosolize it or throw any of that debris into the air and then there's that whole issue of cross contamination on the clean side it is a struggle but i do think you mentioned the boroscope there are better ways so to speak to mm-hmm. to validate and i think this has been a big challenge in the industry and we've talked about it before a couple of shows ago just about getting the proper validation mechanisms in place i think it was um, with marianne drosnock so i did want to ask you though as we continue down this cross-contamination path and we talk about the clean side versus the dirty side and doing you know maybe running those brushes through the washer let's talk about proper storage and biofilm and obviously that will lead into selecting the proper brush to match the diameter of the lumen or cannula that you're trying to clean. So let's let's talk about running them through the washer. Let's talk about proper storage and how to prevent biofilm from building up on the brush. Absolutely. Well, one of the things that I do want to point out is there are a lot of manufacturers um, in our industry currently that are taking a look at how do we make brushes a better cleaning tool. And in comes antimicrobial bristles. And what antimicrobial bristles do is they prevent the growth of microorganisms on the surface of the bristles themselves to to hopefully prevent that cross-contamination or at least help, um, you know, with the cleaning process. Uh, One thing that's kind of interesting is when you talk about proper use and proper storage of brushes, um, a lot of times you can look back to ANSI Amy SC79 and also the brush manufacturer's instructions for use because they will, there will be detailed instructions for the use, the cleaning and decontamination, and also the storage and inspection of these cleaning tools. Um, when you're inspecting a brush, for instance, um, 
making sure you have the right size once you've used a brush. If you have reusable cleaning tools, they do need to be cleaned and disinfected. And that's spelled out in multiple places in the new SP79-2017. Um, for instance, uh, on page 40, it says brushes should be clean and of the appropriate size and bristle type. Worn brushes should be discarded. Reusable brushes should be cleaned after each use and disinfected or sterilized at least once a day. Single-use cleaning implements should be discarded after each use. So it spells out what needs to happen with your cleaning tools. Every cleaning brush that's used in the sterile processing department has an instructions for use. If you're getting it from a, you know, a reputable place that's not a big box store, a hardware store, or anything like that, that details how to properly prepare that brush. Um, and the reason why that's important, the reason why techs need to sort of heed that advice and heed those directions is that there are some really big risks involved with having tools that are mangled. You have a brush that has a bad hair day. Well, guess what? That's actually going to provide an, a huge amount of risk um, to the instruments themselves and ultimately to the patients who are putting their trust in your healthcare facility. You think back to all the different steps involved with preparing instrumentation. And you, you think to yourself, maybe if I have a brush that looks worn, I'll just use it on one more instrument. It's not going to matter because there are so many other steps in this process of creating this safe instrument that using this brush that's kind of mangled doesn't really matter. It's not going to matter in the long run. But the one thing that's, that's so interesting and sort of the profundity of having this conversation with sterile processing techs is that that first step having the right tool, making sure it's properly cared for, making sure to discard it when it's worn. There's a very profound relationship that's built between, for instance, a mechanic and their tools, because that's, that's what they use to create a certain outcome. Same goes for sterile processing techs and brushes. And it may sound trite, but the brushes are their tool that they need to do their job. If you have brushes with worn out bristles, for instance, I saw a brush that had bristles that were sort of at half half cut down and the one question I always ask is where did the rest of that bristle go do you have a little container where you're collecting all the bristles that are falling out of your brushes because if you don't then there's no way to tell if it's down the drain if it's on the floor if it's in an instrument if it's in a patient there's no way to 100% guarantee that you know where those bristles went. Same thing goes for kinked handles. Kinked handles can be just as dangerous because if you have a brush with a kinked handle, when you twist it through your lumens, you're actually going to potentially scratch the inside of that lumen. And when we talk about the formation of biofilm, biofilm can grow within 15 minutes given the correct circumstances um, for growth. And biofilm can be looked at sort of like plaque on your teeth. Plaque is an example of biofilm. And when I ask sterile processing techs, can you remove plaque on your teeth with your toothbrush? And the answer is typically no. You have to go to the dentist and you have to basically have it chiseled off um, because it's this polysaccharide layer um, that's sort of created a shield around itself. It's saying, you know what, I'm staying put. You can't touch me. You can't remove me. This biofilm is, is tough stuff. And so the whole idea of having the right size brush and throwing away brushes that are damaged is to prevent that biofilm growth. Once biofilm grows on the inside of channels specifically, when we talk about scope lumens and we talk about suctions, biofilm growth is really hard to remove. Um, and that's something that we're trying to prevent the growth of in the first place. Excellent. All right. We'll be right back with Lindsay Brown after a short break. All right, Lindsay, we kind of started talking in the last segment about using the right size brush to match the diameter of the lumen or the cannula, but we didn't get to it, and it's a great way to start off this segment talking about dangers of improper brushes or improper brushing, and I think, you know, anytime somebody's going to use a brush that's too large, it's really not going to create that scrubbing action, and then if it's too small, it's not going to scrub all the surfaces inside of the lumen and the cannula, so maybe leap off there and talk about some of the other dangers of improper brushes or improper brushing? There are some terribly serious risks associated with improper brush use and improper brush selection. And I think the number one risk is ineffective removal of 
bio burden that results in patient harm. It results in biofilm formation. It results in so many negative impacts um, that I think that that risk, even though it's sort of high level, it really comes down to why we are in this industry, and that's for patient safety. Um, a couple other risks, damage to the device. Uh, your hospital spends so much money on these instruments and these devices. The last thing that we want to do is use the wrong cleaning tool on them that could potentially damage those devices. Now, there are different types of, of protective methods, like acrylic tips on the, on the end of brushes, um, balls on the end of the brushes to prevent scratching the inside of lumens. Those are different options that can certainly be used um, to prevent the damage to those devices. Um, damage to the brush is also a risk. Uh, even though we're using that brush to clean, we also don't want to damage it during the cleaning process because it will result in broken bristles, broken stems left inside of instrumentation that need to be extracted. Those are all bad things. Those are things we're trying to prevent. Having the right size brush and using it properly prevents those things. And I think another risk that I think gets um, kind of shoved by the wayside a little bit is the additional time that's required for recleaning. All sterile processing departments talk about efficiencies. They talk about improving efficiencies. And I ask this question all the time when I'm in departments giving, you know, education about cleaning brushes. How many of you just are so bored during your shift that you wish you had more to do? And you should see the laser looks that I get from these techs. They're like, lady, are you kidding me? <laughs> of course, we don't have any additional time. Well, why would you want to do this then? Why would you want to add this to your list of things to do? Reclean all of these cleaning or all of these instruments that weren't cleaned properly the first time because you didn't have the right tool. And so I think that that's also a risk that needs to be considered when you're talking about improving efficiencies, when you're talking about, you know, time is money. How do we cut co or how do we save money? but also do a better job. That's a really, really hard sort of issue to tackle. You know, Lindsay, I'll throw in a, another danger of improper brushing, at least, and uh, I'm speaking from experience here, is <laughs> especially with those stainless steel uh, brushes, it is easy if you're not using a safe brushing technique um, to brush your finger um, through... Yeah a plastic glove and Absolutely. there are few things in that department that I would not oh, are that's the worst thing in the department to be punctured by, if you will, because it touches <laughs> right. every dirty thing that comes through. Um, yes, absolutely. So, yeah, I just want to throw out that safety tip to, their, to the audience. Mm -hmm. But um, so we get all the, the correct brushes. We read the IFUs to know the types and also the times. Um, are we brushing for 30 seconds? Are we doing in and out and twisting for 60 seconds in a rinse? Um, but as a leader and as a technician, how do we know uh, particular technicians are competent on these particular brushes? Is this something that we need to write into our annual evaluations and competencies or do skill checks for every particular brush that we have in the department? What's the best practice there? That is a really great question. And I think one of the things that I want to point out is the fact that when we talk about having a brush policy, and I'll go into this a little bit further, but having a brush policy in your department, brush policy wasn't part of our vernacular in the sterile processing world, even as little as three to five years ago. But we're seeing that more and more, each department having something in place as far as a policy is concerned that sort of guides their techs on how to use brushes, when to inspect them, when to discard them. And those brush policies range from these cleaning brushes can be used on one instrument and then thrown away. These cleaning brushes can be used during one case and then thrown away. These cleaning brushes can be used during one shift and then thrown away, so on and so forth. So I think a lot of departments are trying to take a look at how they can, from a high level, um, sort of manage the tech's expectation of of themselves. And so dependent upon what your brush policy is in your department, you can sort of set those expectations. And as long as everybody is on board, that's wonderful. Competencies are a beautiful thing. I am 100% on board with competencies because it is a way for a tech to prove that they are putting stock in what they do on a daily basis. They care about what they do uh, and they respect the greater process. Uh, even though it's just a cleaning brush, they respect the process and they respect that, that that matters in the grand scheme. So as far as competencies are concerned, I think it 
it depends on the cohesiveness of a sterile processing setting. I've been in departments where everybody's on the same page, and I've been in, in departments where nobody's on the same page. And so whether it's individual competencies or whether it's putting a policy in place that says, okay, we're going to reuse our brushes each shift and then throw them away, or we're not going to reuse any brushes. Um, having your techs even sign off on that, that they understand that they can have something concrete to point to as inspectors come in, and really just to rely on when they talk about the importance of what they do affecting patient safety, having that policy um, can really help shape that. Yeah, and I think I, I mentioned it on a previous episode in terms of preparing for those surveyors and just the low hanging fruit of having a timer in your decontaminer area so that you can demonstrate if the IFUs do say to brush for 30 seconds that you can show that you know how long 30 seconds is. Uh, Absolutely. Not, you know, brush a couple times and we're good uh, because exactly. again, that's not what the validation says, you know. Right. And it all comes back to having those instructions for use accessible and available to the staff so that they know those time constraints and those time uh, requirements necessary to clean a device. That's just as important to um, to prove that they know that, that those things do exist um, and that they're variable dependent upon the instructions for use that you're reading. So for the companies out there that perhaps um... – are into instrument tracking softwares or just mm -hmm. the manual tracking department, I would make the recommendation to input those specific brush types and specifications on to a pop-up in Decontam. If you're Absolutely. scanning to tell you any of these three brushes or if you have a limited complexity of inventory, maybe you can put posters up for particular products. But having that stuff, as you say, not only accessible but um, known and easy to find in full PPE and understand, <laughs> right. oh, this yeah. is the brush that I need for this one and not this one, not just the one that's at, uh, at arm's reach, you know. Exactly. Um, there are also other tools. Like I know every brush manufacturer that I can think of has a brush scale um, that can be used in decontam to measure. If there's any question as far as what brush size is necessary for a lumen, for instance, using that quick tool and lining up the hole, you know, with the lumen itself and saying, okay, this is the millimeter brush brush that is necessary, even something as simple as that really helps to ensure that those instruments are getting cleaned properly. So we've gone through the uh, state of the union of brushes, if you will, <laughs> uh, at least the current state. But, you know, we want, uh, before we let you off the hook here, we want to get your perspective on um, the future of brushes. So you mentioned antimicrobial bristles. Uh, our possibility out there now. Um, I know at one point I've seen some battery powered brushes that have been being marketed. I don't know if that mm -hmm. is still around nowadays or not, but um, what does the future look like in terms of brushes Absolutely. for us? One thing that is interesting when you talk about the future of brushes, I can't help but think about the distinction between the brushes required to, cl to clean scopes and those required to clean surgical instruments. You know, when we're cleaning scopes, a lot of the recommendations talk about single-use brushes. In my mind, the question is always there, well, why isn't that sort of the norm? Single-use brushes, it's kind of the easiest way, the safest way to minimize the risk of cross-contamination. Why isn't that being talked about more? Why am I still seeing brushes that look like they were, you know, driven over 18 times by a semi-truck still being used on the decontam side? So I think a lot of it comes down to the conversation of, okay, let's take a look at the, the decontam um, the purpose of it from a broader level. Let's take a look at it and say, why is what we're doing with these devices different than what we're doing with these devices? And I think the conversation will lend itself less toward increasing the, the high-techness of cleaning tools and more toward increasing the, the, the safety and the ease. Because let's be honest, sterile processing departments run a mile a minute right? Managers, techs, lead techs, everyone has so many plates spinning at the same time. How can we not only do a safer job at preparing these instruments, but also make it a little bit easier too? I think that that is sort of um, 
sort of forgotten about, the fact that there are some easy steps that can be taken to minimize that risk of cross-contamination. And the immediate response is money. I get that. The immediate response is money. But let's think about how much it costs to treat a healthcare associated infection. On average, it's $21,000 per person who walks back through your hospital doors with a healthcare associated infection. Now, my guess is if you compared those costs with the costs of moving toward, for instance, a single use cleaning option, those, the costs would would certainly not outweigh the benefits of doing so. So I think that that is part of what the future looks like. Until we get there, I feel like that's maybe like 2030. <laughs> until we get there, there are certain things like antimicrobial brushes. There are certain things like protective tips on the cleaning brushes that go through lumens to prevent those scratches, to prevent anything that bio burden can be harbored in. So there are certain things that can be used currently um, that will make the immediate future a lot brighter as far as instrument cleaning is concerned. All right, Lindsay, you have been just a phenomenal guest, and I can tell you that your passion comes across to the listener. Hank and I, I can tell you, this one zoomed right by. It doesn't even feel like it's been an hour that we've been talking. (laughs) So I just want to thank you for sharing such great knowledge and very detailed and accurate. You know your stuff. So I can definitely say to our listeners that they can take every nugget that you put out there on this episode uh, for truth. And so good job. I would thank say you thank much. you. Yeah, thank you for, for making time to, to share that with us. Thank you guys for for being the future of sterile processing as far as making knowledge more easily accessible, making education more easily accessible. It's really nice to be able to just turn on your podcast when I'm in the car, when I'm at work, when I'm at home. And I think that that's, we talked about the future of the brush. I think that's the future of, of education is just making it more accessible. And you guys are doing an awesome job at that. So thank you very, very much. Well, thank you for listening to the shows, and you even cross-promoted one of our shows for us during the episode, so (laughs) you could probably have one of these yourself. So just thank you again, and everybody, that was Lindsay Brown, Clinical Education Manager at Key Surgical. Hank, what a fantastic guest. I know we got to talk about... A lot of things, well, all things brushes, and a lot of people, as we said earlier, may think, ah, it's just brushes, but we filled up a full hour of content with a lot of great information for the listeners. That's right, Justin. If there were an epicenter to sterile processing cleaning, it would all revolve around the brush. Uh, if it's toothbrushes or if it is the controversial stainless steel brush, um, that is what makes or breaks our cleaning process oftentimes. So a fantastic guest and a great topic to delve into with Lindsay. Yeah, and if it's not clean, it can't be sterile. And other than automated mechanisms for cleaning, what's the number one tool for manual cleaning? It's brushes. And so I'm glad we got a chance to talk about brushes on the clean side, which has been a longstanding topic of debate. I'm glad that she clarified stainless steel brushes and rust. I just think so many good pieces of information in this interview today. That's right. That rust topic was a big one as well. I have heard firsthand many times, and I'm excited to see the future of brushes, as she talked about, and that single-use option um, all the way down to the antimicrobial bristles, too, that are already on the market. So a lot of exciting things this episode. Uh, hopefully it's a engaging one for the audience as well. All right, that's going to do it for this week's show. As a reminder, you can help support us by subscribing to Beyond Clean on iTunes and Stitcher. We'd certainly appreciate a rating and a review because your feedback is important to the show. And on behalf of Hank and myself, thank you for listening to another edition of Beyond Clean.